I don't have the experience that Grace has living in Ferguson, and I don't have the experience that Marvin has being an African American man in America. All I can give you is an educational perspective from a sociological background because that's what I do. So I happen to be teaching sociology over the summer at um, Maryville University. I have two jobs, full-time here, part-time there. I need money. And I was coming to the last class of the semester, and our chapters were collective behavior, acting crowds, social movements. And the event took place over the weekend, the shooting of Michael Brown. And then my class met that week. And some of my students at Maryville were um, students who live in Ferguson or in the North County area. So there was this desire to talk. They wanted to talk about it. And I, I saw it as, again, the teachable moment, capturing this moment in time where we can understand um, not necessarily the race relations, but we can understand the crowd. What happened with the crowd? And why did it get to where it got to? And we're still there. It's not over. The other interesting thing that was happening at the same time in both of these events, the shooting in Ferguson, but also the ice bucket challenge, were just everywhere. And it was such an interesting dynamic. We're watching human suffering, we're watching racism, pain, suffering, and we're watching people dump buckets of ice water on their head to raise money for a cause. And so my students were very conflicted, as was I. How can we live in this society where we just constantly are revolving from anger to hope and anger to hope and anger to hope on the same day, the same Twitter feed. So it was very interesting, and I allowed my students to choose which example of collective behavior they wanted to write about, Ferguson or the Ice Bucket Challenge. If you want to hear more about the Ice Bucket Challenge, you can ask me later because that was very interesting. I'm going to talk about Ferguson. So we're talking about collective behavior, which is behavior that it, it sp suspends all social norms. You're all following a social norm. You're attending an academic presentation, you're sitting, you're paying attention. Some of you are on your phones because you're not interested, that's all right, we don't hold that against you. Um, but you're following a set of social norms. And we usually do that in a collective group, in a social crowd. We have norms that govern our behavior, we follow those norms, everything's good. But there are times where the actions of the group will bypass the norms and something new will happen. So if there was a fire alarm that went off, we're going to react and we're going to act collectively. Now we know the rules of fire alarms, orderly, women and children first, men stay and perish. But there might be some chaos at that time. And so we watched some chaos ensue. And we saw some specific examples of collective behavior occur in Ferguson. And these are fairly predictable collective responses to an action when there are some circumstances that are in place. So we saw rioting. Tons of rumors fueled by the media, fueled by individuals, fueled by ignorance and inexperience. We saw some panic and a little bit of mass hysteria, people just kind of freaking out. People who live in Ferguson, people who live around Ferguson, people who were avoiding Ferguson and North County at all costs because they were so panicked. The moral panic gets into our fears that we are going to be perhaps personally assaulted as a result of this. Fads and fashions, that even plays a role in what happened in Ferguson, and eventually one day this will be an urban legend. So we're seeing every aspect of collective behavior in one event. And this is behavior that was noted many, many years ago. So as Grace has pointed out, discrimination and racism has been around forever, and so is collective behavior. Um, it was a British journalist who was watching you know, nice, ordinary country folk who turned into this angry mob, this stampede. They were like herds, and their attitudes and, and behaviors just snapped. And they went from being good country folk to being this angry, reacting crowd at various times. So he was the first person to really talk about the herd mentality and how crowds, being in a group, can change you, the individual. So if you're sitting at home watching the news reports on Ferguson, maybe you had a personal response to it. And maybe you called a couple friends who perhaps share your perspectives so that you could commiserate about how you were feeling. But if you were in Ferguson, that crowd behavior can change. It can change your behavior. It can change your psyche. It can change everything. So 50 years later, we have a French psychologist who's talking about how when you're in a crowd, you feel a little bit anonymous. You know, you're blending in. You're not going to stand out. So if one of you is on your phone, we're not going to point you out and say, hey, you on your phone, because there are other people on the phone too, and there are a lot of you here, and do I really care if one person's on the phone? So you feel less accountable for your personal behavior because you're surrounded by people who can hide you and blend in with you. 
And sometimes you feel invincible, like you can go above and beyond. I'm going to do something big because I'm in a crowd, and the crowd will do it with me. And I tell my sociology students, you don't run naked across campus by yourself. You streak in a group. You all go together, naked butts all the way, so that you don't feel like you're going to stand out. So this, this collective mind, or what we call groupthink, develops, and it sweeps you up. And you may even do things that and you would never consider doing before, because you're swept up in the, the emotion, the excitement of what's going on. And this can then, like mass hysteria, it becomes hypnotic, and it takes over this crowd mentality, this crowd behavior. So what happened in Ferguson? Um, it often goes a little bit like this. There's social unrest, and there is a history of social unrest in Ferguson. We know this. It is dated back to the 1800s. It is tense. The tension is there. And then it gets manifested as people are talking about it, especially if you're in or near the area where the unrest has been for so long. And so the shooting takes place, and then what happens is there's this communication. I'm talking to Paul. I'm saying, did you hear? He's like, no, what happened? There was a shooting. Tell me more. And we start talking and we feed off of each other. And we start fueling it with rumors. Well, I don't really know what happens, but here's what I think I know what happened, and um, probably we're right. And now Paul's angry too. And we're both like, oh man, we gotta do something. So we talk to Marvin. Marvin, did you hear? Yeah, I heard. How do you feel? And then we start to just circulate this emotion back and forth, and we collectively get this impulse to do something. We gotta do something. But the three of us aren't gonna do it alone. We need people. We need backup, we need a posse, we need a stampede, we need a herd. So if you're in a crowd and you can convince the crowd to feel the same way you feel, you can collectively focus that energy. And so we become an acting, acting crowd. We're an excited group and we're moving toward a goal. And this excited group, it took a little while to develop, but they got there. So it starts with the tension or unrest, then there's an exciting event, that was the shooting. But because we're in the age of media, it took a couple days to kind of get more information and decide, do we need to act or are we good? So there was some action taking, about, taking place at the time, but it took a couple days to really kind of gain some momentum. So people are milling about, they're standing around, they're talking about the event some more. They're trying to get information, and when you don't have information, you fill the blanks with rumors and speculation. And then people accept that as fact because they don't know any differently and you seem smart, so you must know what you're talking about. So that continues this excitement. And then there's the common object of attention. What are we going to do? QT, let's take it down. Let's move toward it. So the energy needs to be expended and the group needs to do something, so they look for somebody or something to focus that energy. And then they have the common impulses. Let's burn it down. Let's break it down. Let's throw stuff. So, and these are common crowd reactions. We see this all over the country and all over the world, and sometimes we just don't even know when it's gonna happen. Because there's a lot of unrest everywhere, and there are a lot of these shootings, as Paul pointed out with his statistics. These take place all the time. Why is it that this one has turned into what it has turned into? Because we were primed and ready. We were 100 years in the making. We've been ready for this event for a long time, and it happened. So acting crowds don't always have to be negative or destructive. Sometimes they do respond peacefully. Maybe it is a, a candlelight vigil. And those attempts were made in Ferguson. There were groups that said, we want to respond, but we want to respond peacefully. We want to make a point, but we don't want this to draw you know, the negative attention. But it took another turn as well, and there was rioting, and there was looting, and the media got involved, and so we had a different view. So the emergent norms are the new norms that are established um, when things are disrupting our normal life, and we have to respond with new norms, new situation. I'm also running out of time, so I'm like, what do I gotta say, what do I don't want to say? So to deal with the new events, we established new norms. Children didn't go to school, and we understood why. Businesses, businesses had to shut down, we understand why. Some people had to go stay with relatives, and we understand why, because the old way of living was currently suspended. You didn't get to do what you normally did when you lived in North County for a while. Some people still aren't comfortable going back there. You know, the children's education has suffered as a result because new norms had to emerge. And not everybody in the crowd felt the same way. That has been very clearly identified. So the five types of crowd participants, you do have people who are ego involved. They have a personal stake in what's going on. Residents in Ferguson, the family of Michael Brown, police officers, 
Wilson's family, these are all people who have a clear connection to what's going on. You have the concerned, we're interested, but we're not as involved. Maybe it's because we don't live there. We know people who do live there. We're concerned about our friends, our community, how St. Louis is being portrayed to others. You have the insecure, and we saw those people coming from all over the place. This was just an opportunity to feel powerful. This is the looting. This is what has some of us so upset, is that people who felt powerless now feel powerful, but they're directing that power in a very destructive way. They're ruining the businesses in Ferguson. Why would you do that in your own community? Not everybody was from that community. Some people came in from other communities. A lot of curious spectators, that's the media. And the world. I mean, people around the world are tuned into what's going on, and they don't even know it's Ferguson anymore. They just think it's St. Louis, Missouri, so we all have been categorized differently. But people are curious. We want to know, and the media feeds that curiosity. And then you have people who have taken advantage of the situation, who are exploiting the situation. And I just picked one example, and, and then I'm gonna run out of time, but the t-shirt industry. You have t-shirts. You have t-shirts to support the Brown family and their residents of Ferguson, and you have t-shirts to support Wilson and police officers. And so those were t-shirts that were sold to raise money, and I was trying to find additional t-shirts for Wilson, and they were just, we support Wilson, offer, and it was a shield, a police shield. The one that really, really I find so offensive is the keep calm and don't shoot. That's exploitation because it's taking this trite phrase that we use, you know, keep calm, carry on, keep calm, do this, keep calm. It's pop culture, and we're taking a very serious event and turning it into a pop culture culture item that you can purchase online for $9.99. That's all I have.